we're, we're going to be moving on this morning. We're, we're going, uh, you look up there, it says table manners. We're not really talking about etiquette this morning. So if you are a very informal dining family, don't worry, that's not what it's talking about. But if you're not familiar with Corinthians, you might have been wondering since we were just talking about apparel. But <clears throat> some of you have d very different backgrounds when it comes to how you eat a meal. And some of those are cultural, some of those are subcultural, and some of those are just family of origin. They have no rhyme or reason. That's just the way you do things. Um, now, I was taught to eat with very good manners. And you're like, really? Yeah, and I said, no, I was. I was, I was taught correctly. I was taught things like exactly how all the place settings go, how the spoons go in coordination, how you know the knife should be facing inward, how you have the, the napkin set. And we had to set our place settings. Even when it was informed, we had to put them down correctly because otherwise um, we had to go and redo it. But we had, we had to know these things because my mom came from a very proper German Lutheran family. So whenever, whenever we went there for holidays, you had to, it was, it was kind of the children should be seen and not heard. You're very quiet. You listen to the adults speak. Go, could you please pass me the butter? Thank you. Yeah, it, it was not, not the free-for-all. That was my dad's side of the family. It was like, you eating that? Yeah. You know? Uh, so, so I got a little bit of both word, worlds mixed in there. Um, you know, so, so we learned those things about how not to talk with your mouth full, you know, and speak when spoken to. And we also learned things at our own home, um, which is probably my dad's influence, but my mom wasn't a stick in the mud. You know, how to hang spoons on your nose while you're eating. And, uh, I, but I, but I, was, I was firmly rebuked as a small child. I always thought when my glass was empty, Instead of asking politely or waiting, I could just rattle it against the table until my mom would bring me more, and, and I was corrected very quickly. Um, as my children tried to do that too, I just realized oh, that, that is annoying. It just Sometimes it is a command for parents to love your children. It's not just a natural thing, correct? I mean, because children have a, a way of, well, acting like their parents did when they were younger. But we're going to talk today about, about the Lord's table. And, that, and that's what we're going to get into here. Now, that I'm going to use some terms interchangeably this morning. Uh, the Lord's table, you may know that as the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, or communion. And that's that observance that we in our church do once a month. It doesn't say specifically when to do it, but we are commanded as believers to observe the Lord's sacrificial offering of himself through the bread and through the cup. And if you've been coming here for any time, especially it's usually on the first Sunday of the month, it's the way we normally do it. Next month will be a little bit different with our Good Friday service and with Easter and as we go around the holiday, which celebrates that same event. But when you have the bread, which symbolizes his broken body, when you have the cup to represent his shed blood. And that's what we're referring to, the Lord's table. And so you might be thinking initially, oh, good, it's finally something easy uh, that we're dealing with. We're just dealing with um, how, how to take communion. This is, this is an easier subject than all the ones we've been dealing with that Paul's been addressing so far in this book. But it's not really true. I think as, as we go through this this morning, you're going to see there's a lot of value statements that we still need to consider and make sure that we are being obedient and accurate in, in our response to Scripture. So pray with me, and let's ask that God would, would speak to us this morning, and let's jump right in. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would speak to us and that we would be led by you, that you would truly be the one to instruct us, to show us if there's areas of shortcoming, and correct us if we need correction, but also to encourage us if what we are doing is correct. And I pray that in all things that you will draw us closer to you and help us to reflect you more clearly to a world that needs to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> We're going to start here in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 23, we'll read a few verses and stop. We're going to look at this in three different sections. And Paul is writing because apparently the Corinthians have found a way to mess up even communion. You're like, by now you figured out, and these people can't do anything right. I, but, but that being said, I'm really glad that God has not written a, a letter to the Church of Sunrise to be commemorated with all of our you know, public failings for all time. So we praise God that the Corinthians get to make the mistakes that the rest of us can live by and relate to um, sometimes very, very closely. But we read in verse 23, chapter 11. Oh, actually, excuse me, back to 17. That's the second section. Se se verse 17, chapter 11. 
Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. That's not, you know it's not good advice right there already. Since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So let's look at what Paul is, Paul is saying here. He's got a rebuke, and there's an abuse of the Lord's table. Uh, what's commonly, it, it can be referred to by some biblical scholars and professors, if, if you go to a Bible college, is they'll say they would, the Corinthians and a lot of the early church had a practice of what they would call the love feast. And it was kind of a continuation out of this, this celebration of what Christ has done, of observing the elements of communion. And so they would have, which in very good Baptist tradition, a potluck. Right? And they say, we will have a big meal because in ancient cultures and even in modern cultures like our own, one of the ways that we have fellowship with one another and interact with one another is over food. We will share a meal. And so they would sh- come together for the sharing of a meal, just as reminiscent of how Christ, when he, when he gave us these instructions, it was over a meal with his disciples. But unfortunately, their meal is such a detraction is such a shame that Paul now needs to correct them and to give them table manners or potluck etiquette. And he'll go on about the more serious matters. He says, what you are doing is shameful. When you come together, you are coming together as gluttons, basically. Like ravenous, a pack of hungry wild dogs. I, I, I used to be a youth pastor for a long time. And sometimes we would have food. And we'd put it out. And we know that those young men were raised better than they would sometimes display. But we had to teach them etiquette. Do not trample the young ladies on the way to the table. Do not take more than your plate can hold. And you would think, this, this should be common sense, right? But some people, it's like, you know, it's it's pizza or sugar. The eyes just roll black in their head, and they just lunge. And, and this is kind of what's going on with the Corinthians. But they don't have the excuse of, you know, testosterone-addled brains, you know, obscuring all common sense. It's rather adults behaving just absolutely improperly and shamefully. And he goes on, he says, look, you have factions. You have factions. And we already read about this earlier. Some say, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Oh, I'm of Peter. Oh, well, I'm with the Jesus group. And so these people, they each have their own little cliques, their own little clubs. And so when they're coming together to eat, they've kind of got their own little table. Is this not reminiscent for some of you of high school? Even those of you a long time ago, it's like, yeah, I have to sit at this table in this social strata. Whenever people say that we're, we don't have a segregated society, the most segregated place in society is a high school lunchroom, right? Usually, you've got the athlete's table. You got the computer geeks table. <laughs> you know what? They will make a lot more money than that athlete's table, let me tell you. So make sit there. Make friends. Um, but you got the band table. You got, you know, whatever kinds of tables. I, I haven't been in high school for a long time. But you knew certain people, they had their tables. Sometimes it's by grade. I remember as a freshman, you didn't dare sit, sit at a junior or senior's table. I was, that was just asking to be stuck in a trash can. And I was the right size for that, so I avoided those tables. <clears throat> but that's what they're doing at church. Saying they got their own little factions. We have our own table, and we brought our own food, and you can't have it. Because he says, look, at some of the people with money and wealth, they come together and they bring a big meal, and they're sharing it with their friends, and they're diving in, and they're eating till they can barely waddle out of the church. And other people are being shunned or left in the other place. Maybe they don't have as much to offer. And they're going away and they're hungry. And it just turns into this self-indulgent, selfish meal where they can feed their, themselves and not care about one another. 
And obviously, selfishness is not something that's limited to the first century, that we as believers have to be very careful to guard against that. About putting our own needs first. Now, surely we, our needs should be met one to another. But so many times, I know that even, even today in churches across this country, that we don't come together for, for the body. We don't come together to honor Christ. We can come together with a very, uh, in a bad way, a very American-centric saying, I want to be a consumer, and I want to consume. And I want to take. And the Corinthians had this down a long time before we did. And I know, I know that, uh, that we can be just as petty. No, I mean, probably not food. You guys do really good at potlucks around here. And we don't want to cancel the potlucks. Because some of you make really good food. So, some families like myself, we cheat. We, we stop by Little Caesars on the way there and get the $5 pizza. It disappears fast, though, so I'm, I'm happy. But, um, but we, that's not our problem. But can, can there be? We know in churches across this valley and across this country that people can get in arguments about things that are just, just as silly. Churches have split over carpet color. True story. People get so like, like I, I will not go to that church if that's that carpet color. What? You won't go? We, what? There's another church, one of the classic stories. A church had a split over what side they were putting the organ on. You're like, well, praise God, we don't have an organ in here anymore. But uh, because, no, it has to be on the right. No, it has to be on the left. No, it has to be in the middle. And actually, one of these church stories, and this is a true story from way back, they fought so much about the organ, they decided someone hid the organ. No one knew where it went. And a few years later, and they said, we're not doing it until you guys can start getting along. And then they finally found it, like three years later, in the baptistry. Which is a really bad sign, because that means that baptistry had not been used in three years. We can get our eyes in all the wrong places. And the Corinthians are serving as an example of what we can be if our eyes become petty and selfish and self-indulgent. And but you hear Paul saying, how does this honor Christ? Which is the reason we should be here. When the Corinthians, of course, are taking this to an extreme, they've taken their carnality and sinfulness into the observance of the Lord's Supper. So it's not just the meal around it, but now it's, it's continuing to the Lord's table itself. That sacred observance that Jesus Christ himself instituted. And we're, we're going to look at this here. Continuing now in verse 23. And Paul continues saying, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Those words should sound really familiar to you. You may say, why does pastor say the same thing over and over again? It's just because my usual speech around the Lord's table comes usually, I, I vary it every once in a while, but usually comes right here out of Corinthians. Because that's what Jesus Christ himself said. When I say this is my body which is broken for you, it's because those are the words of instruction that Paul received that Jesus himself said. And it's, it's the words, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now your, your version may be slightly different, but is that thing that Jesus himself had, he said this for us to watch. Now, Jesus Christ gave us two specific things we had to do. Now, they're not things you earn your salvation. I don't want you to think if you don't do these things, you can't be a Christian. Though a Christian should do these things. Birds should fly. You see, a bird, and, and I'm not talking about ostriches, okay? <clears throat> but you see a bird, an eagle that just walks everywhere, you're going to be, that, that eagle is pretty, pretty silly or stupid because they fly. Fish swim. Christians should do things that honor God. They don't make them a Christian, but that is what they should do. And he said there's two things that all believers should do. Um, we should observe the Lord's death, sacrificial atonement through the table. 
It's our way of remembering him. We'll talk, we're going to talk more about that. And you should obviously publicly profess through baptism. We call those ordinances because there are two things that God said that all believers should do. Now, like I said, they don't save you. But they are, are behaviors that Jesus and Christ himself commanded. Now, in the Catholic Church, they call those sacraments. And we don't use that term because sacrament was used to mean it's a way by which you receive grace from God. And we don't think you can, you can like manufacture grace through, for, through any one human box. God gives his grace in a variety of ways. And we can experience God's grace whenever we operate, whenever we act in faith and obedience. You are going to be experienced, not maybe receive more grace, but you're going to experience God's grace in a very different way than if you are living in a manner that is casual or disobedient. And you, you all can know that. When you step out in faith, which is one of the commands of God. When you step out in faith and when you're walking in obedience, you're going to feel God's presence in a way when you wouldn't when, if you're living otherwise. And because let me tell you about my own chances when I've had to walk in faith, I, I, I hate walking in faith, and you guys know that. I'm a let's walk by sight type guy. But you know what? I've never felt closer to God and felt some of the biggest growth in my own life than when I obediently stepped out to do what I knew he had called me to do. Sometimes that's sharing your faith. And you know God is like pushing on your back. Say something. Say something. And you're like, I don't hear you. You know, you're like that little kid. I can't hear you. Nope, nope, not me. And you're like, and then you might be having an argument with God. And sometimes it's even out loud in the car. No, 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 no. Bob Christopoulos would do such a better job. Bob will talk to anyone. But so you can go with those type of things. But we need to live lives of faith and obedience. Um, but however, whether even though we're not calling these sacraments, which you want you to understand that the church throughout history has considered the communion and the Lord's table of such great importance. And why is it? It's because the elements there, the bread and the cup, are the, the symbols of his Christ's broken body. And so it's, it's a word picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It is why we're here, because he went to the cross taking our sins upon himself. Because he took our place and accomplished what we could not. And so many times, if we do not focus back on the cross, that we would get off on all manner of tangents. We'd be so askew in our thinking. And Christ accommodates us in our weaknesses and says, you need to remember this. There's lots of good things, but this is the thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing when you watch um, some veterans, the way that they treat the American flag. And I'm not saying that other people who haven't served in the armed forces don't treat it with the same sort of respect, but you can, you can really see something special when you see somebody who's actually served, especially those people who've had to pay very big sacrifices, and, and the reverence which they give to a flag. And, and we know that really the flag in and of itself is nothing. It's just fabric and patterns. But what it has come to mean for those veterans, and for many of you as well, I know, is wrapped up so much with that object, what it symbolizes, that the two are really not separate, able to be separated. And you see people who, who will treat it with such honor and such dignity, this common piece of fabric, because some of them aren't even made that well. But it's what it means. And that's, that's what communion is. It's not a good snack. It's a horrible snack. Have you tasted some of those wafers sometimes? I've gone to some churches, and I, sometimes it's like eating styrofoam or cardboard. And you're like, this, this is not good. And, and it's grape juice, and it's a little tiny cup of grape juice. It's like, it, you could not fill yourself, not the way we observe it. But all that to say, it is still such a beautiful, meaningful time, because it's not about the size of the cup or the flavor of the bread. It is This is tell, reminding me that Jesus Christ broke his own body, and what he done is so wrapped up in it. And yes, I believe it's a symbol. But we, we give it special respect because Jesus Christ asked us to do it. And because it should draw our minds 
to what he has done. That just like the veterans, you can't separate it. It's, it's a symbol, but it means so much to us. And let me tell you, when we, when we take it, and it says it here in this verse, it says when we, when we take this, we are proclaiming Christ's death. That is one of the ways we give testimony to what Jesus Christ has done by partaking in this and saying we are recognizing that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And there have been people who have come to Christ by watching communion. And to me, it's not that evangelistic of an observance, but you know, people have seen who may be more visual or maybe that kind of, that kind of a thinking style have said, I get it. I get what Christ has done. And I hope that we as believers, in taking that observance, remember what Christ has done. But Paul is not very happy. And he's not very happy because God's not very happy. And we get to a little bit the more difficult portion of this passage. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you will come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So we look here, and, and, and Paul says, I want to warn you, this is a serious thing, and you run the risk of bringing judgment or guilt upon yourself if you mistreat it. He says, this, this is a holy thing, and you're treating it contemptuously. He's speaking of this to the Corinthians. And, and to treat the symbol with contempt, Paul is saying, is really to treat Christ's sacrifice with contempt. He says, this represents Christ's blood. What, what, what is there in all of creation that is more sacred than Christ's shed blood and his broken body than what he has done? He says, don't treat this as a small thing. He says, when you do this, you are bringing judgment on yourself. He says, judge yourselves. He always hears this, you can't judge me, only God can judge Well, you know what he says, God, God will judge you. Make no mistake. God is the judge. And when, when we do rebuke a believer, it should be from an attitude of love, because we want to spare you that judgment. It shouldn't be from a hateful place. It shouldn't be from a prideful place. It shouldn't be from all of his other things, but we want to spare you that judgment. He says, but judge yourselves. If you can keep yourself in line, then you don't have to be chastened. You know, I, I, a lot of this, I, I think, again, with my children, I'm like, if you do the right thing, you don't have to worry about talking to dad. It's really easy. You do the wrong thing. You treat your mom bad. You lie to your teacher. You, you know, whatever. It's, it's not going to go well for you. So keep yourself in good order, and then you don't have judgment. But he says, because of this, some are weak, some are sick, and some are sleeping, meaning some are dead. We, we don't often think about that anymore. In kind of this live and let live culture, that God has standards. And he calls his people to standards. And just as a, a good parent will give his children discipline, so that they can live a life that is honoring and productive. God wants his children to be honoring and productive. Because if you're just going to waste time and shame yourself, so you might as well bring you home anyway. Now maybe you think that's, that's unusually harsh, but keep in mind, this world is not all there is. This is not our goal. This is not our glory. If you're just going to shame yourself here, then it's like time to come home. As when my kids, my kids are acting up in the neighborhood, I hear him causing trouble, fighting with a neighbor two doors down. Like, and now you're coming home. <laughs> we, need, we need to think our actions matter. But, but I, I do want to, I do want to um, note also that, remember, not all hardship is discipline. The Bible is very clear on that. 
I think when you're going through hardship, the first thing that we should do is examine ourselves and ask God, God, am I going through these difficulties because there's something wrong in me? Am I being disobedient? I think we should be honest with that. A self-judging going to God. That we should say, God, am I going through a hardship because I'm harboring resentment? Am I going through a hardship because I'm being a jerk? It's not even divine discipline. It's just common return on my actions. Am I going through this difficult time? Um, are my prayers not being heard because, as we read in Scripture and read last week, because I'm not treating my wife right, so you're not listening to my prayers. Husbands, that's in the Bible. Um, we, we should self-examine ourselves. But don't presume on everyone else that because they're going through a difficulty or even on your own self that it's necessarily discipline. In fact, the Bible is very clear in First Peter that we will suffer just because we're a Christian. Because we're in a world which is opposed to the things of God. And it says, Dear friends, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you. Not because of disobedience, but because that's the way it works. Again, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, You must endure hardship. What? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We know that soldiers aren't off on luxury cruises. And I don't know what any recruiter promised you. You don't join the Navy to go to Hawaii and to like lay on beaches. They, they actually make you work. But a good soldier will endure hardship. James 1.12, uh, of course, says, My brothers can count it joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. So don't think that any hardship is necessarily because of only because of bad behavior, but also that we know that any discipline builds character, and we could look at Hebrews 12 because God is cheating, treating us as children, children that he loves, and he wants, just as we want our children to behave appropriately and grow, to reflect our name in a good light. God wants us to reflect his name in a way that honors him and draws people to the cross. Verse 32 here in chapter 11 says, When we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord so that we may not be condemned with the world. God, God does not punish his children out of meanness, but rather out to make us holy and to make us an effective witness. And the Corinthians have got this wrong. They, they don't care. They're, they have no concern for their witness for what the world sees, for how they represent Christ. And their offense is so grievous to the Lord and the lack of unity that is trampling the cross. They, think about it. We've talked about the immoral believer earlier in this book. He was still alive. But some of these people with their lack of unity, with their trampling the cross, some of them were dead. Well, we need to... Uh, we need to consider who, who it is that we should be. First and foremost, I hope next time we take communion, I was actually originally a long time ago, I thought, I'm going to have this on a communion Sunday. And then I forgot about it. And I'm like, well, all right, I guess we'll have it today. But think about the significance of the offering that Jesus has done for you. There's a reason we ask non-believers to kindly let it go by. And we don't, we don't want to shame anyone. We're not trying to leave anyone out. But it doesn't mean anything doesn't mean anything. And to us, it's not just something we do. It's, it's, a, it's a great remembrance. And there's times, maybe in your own life, you've done this, when you'll see a believer let the plate go by. And that's okay. Because sometimes, if they say, you know what, I've, I've got something in my life I want to make right. And for me to be living sinfully is, and to take of this, it's making a mockery of it. And it's not always saying I'm not saying sin. Maybe it's saying, you know what? God convicted me of something this morning, and I need to make this right. I need to apologize to someone. Or I'm just not in a good place. It doesn't have to be. That's, that, that's an acceptable thing to do. We don't want to put on our faces, oh, I'm a good Christian, even though I hate my brother. I'm going to take. No, it's, it's the unity. Communion means to come together, bringing into unity. And that's one of the things God says often. It says, if you have an offense with a brother, go and make it right. And then come back and give your offering. And, and there's similar principles around the Lord's table. We need to take it seriously. Paul says in verses 33 and 34, and we already read this, Therefore, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. 
you know, um, he's saying, don't, don't worry about leaving full of food. That's not why we're here. We get to come together as a body of Christ. And we may be learning to like each other. Some of you are like, yeah, I, I can barely stand you, Pastor, but the rest of these people are pretty great. And I'd say amen. So, um, <clears throat> but the thing is, we need to learn to come together and to show the love of Christ and have that unity and what is the fellowship of the body as in, and take, when we take the cup and, and the bread as a reflection of Christ's sacrifice and love for all of us. And if, even if it's a potluck, which is not the holy significance of the Lord's table, that we need to treat each other well. The joy isn't that we get to eat. It, it's pretty joyful, don't get me wrong. But that's not the premier category. It's saying it's that we get to be together as a body of Christ. And if you're still hungry on the way home, I'm sure there's a McDonald's drive through open. And you know what? It's a lot better to eat one of their hamburgers. And some of you may not believe it, but it's true. It's a lot better to eat one of their hamburgers than to treat each other badly. And if you don't like McDonald's, go home and make yourself a bowl of cereal. And it'll be good too. He says, rather, don't concern with how full you are. But come here with love for the body and with a right attitude and heart for one another. Come here considering what it is that Jesus Christ has done for you. Who laid down his own life and set aside his own rights. So that we could be part of his family. Now let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that you are patient with us. That you rebuke us when you could surely... You could surely discipline us with so, so much more than you give us, Lord. And we, and we recognize how many times you, you give us second and third chances and you minimize the effects of what we've done. And we don't even acknowledge that or realize that. And we take, we take things lightly that we should take seriously. And we obsess about things which are of little importance. But I pray, God, that we would continue to be molded into your character, with your heart, that we would not be content to say we've grown enough and we won't go any further, but God, that you would make us your people and give us a love for one another and give us a great, great love for your son and the sacrifice that he made for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.